All right. So welcome to the inaugural episode of our podcast, Under the Influence. I am Katie. Bailey. (laughs) (laughs) Are are you an alien? (laughs) Bailey. I am Bailey. I should have done that. (laughs) I am Bailey. (laughs) Okay. So the premise of our podcast is to talk about artists that have influenced us heavily and then whoever our guest is whoever has influenced them heavily heavily can i keep saying heavily (laughs) anyways um and then maybe just a few controversial topics mixed in just to spice it up a little bit so since it's our first episode we thought we would talk about a group and person that has influenced both me and bailey bailey and me (laughs) Heavily? God, can I come up with another freaking adverb? Is that an adjective? Adverb? (laughs) Come on now. I mean... Adjective. Adjective, thank you. I'm also horrible. Grammar was the worst. I was horrible at grammar. Loved English. This is your time to shine, sister. So, with that being said, we present the Talking Heads, which obviously is headed by the genius of David Byrne. So I was like three or four, and MTV was actually playing music videos, and I remember specifically seeing the Once in a Lifetime video. Have y'all, have you ever seen it? Yes. Okay. And he's like just doing this over and over again, (laughs) and he's super spazzy, and I was like, what is this? And it was so enigmatic, and I was so drawn to it at such a young age that I knew I was strange, (laughs) but I just fell in love with it immediately, and that was kind of where... I started my mm-hmm. love for the Talking Heads it was very, very young, but yeah. they were so different. Like there was just nothing like that yeah. at the I, time. I was kind of older when I like actually discussed. Like I'd always known of the Talking Heads and David Byrne, but I was older when I really started like diving in and listening. And it was, I mean, I started writing music at thirteen, so I kind of like gone through so many different phases with music but all that to say I really started listening to them when I started writing more and um yeah so I I think I started with speaking in tongues first which is still my favorite and I think it's because it's mine too well it's what made me fall in love with them Mm -hmm. you know and so I started with speaking in tongues but I also really like remain in light I like the electronic instrumentation on it um, but yeah, speaking in tongues, I feel like just the production in general on that album just speaks volumes and it's really inspired me as an artist and I've referenced it so many times, even with my band. Um, also, um, stop making sense concert. Mm-hmm. I have watched so many times. Me too. So many times. And I don't know, they sweat a lot. <laughs> in, in, in that concert yeah. but it is so amazing um, but yeah speaking in tongues is like beginning to end just yeah. a masterpiece well even like cause on stage there's been so many things that I have taken from that concert and obviously I don't act like David Byrne on stage but just the way they use the lighting um, the movement just everything about it I feel like was just flawless and mm-hmm. I've studied it so much do you know what else is underrated? True Stories. The soundtrack to True Stories. Yeah. Oh, that is, I love that so much. I know the soundtrack, but I've still yet to see the movie. I, I don't know how. Don't I don't know, know how. You, how. Can, you have no credibility anymore because you. I don't know how, how I can call can myself a David Byrne fan. I exactly. Know, I, know, I know. And Livin' McKinney. <laughs> yeah, it was filmed here by one of your favorite guys. I know, so. I know. But, I mean, that's got some great songs. But Dream Operator is one of my favorite Talking Heads songs of all time. And it's from that soundtrack. It's just beautiful. And I think a lot of people don't know about it. But yeah. you should definitely listen to Dream Operator. It's a good one. Yeah. So, um, we've talked about our favorite Talking Heads albums. We have a guest here who it's his time to shine right now. Hello. Hello. It's good to be here. <laughs> just go Declan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've just been sitting kind of staring at you both for the past 10 minutes. So. That's not creepy. <laughs> so, Declan, um, number one, what is your favorite? I already know the answer to this, but what is your favorite Talking Heads album? 
Uh, remain in light. Okay. And then, so Declan is really big into EDM music. So I'd be curious to see or know what influence um, the Talking Heads or David Byrne or even Brian Eno, any of that had on your music and your career. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's safe to say that that album specifically, but the Talking Heads, like, at large have influenced me as a musician. Um, I think something that stands out to me about them as a band is just their willingness to take risks. I really like when bands are willing to take risks. And for me, David Byrne has always been kind of this person, this figure who constantly pushes, you know, like he's, he's constantly pushing his craft forward in a lot of ways. And so, um, I really respect that about them. I'm, I'm very inspired by that. I think with, uh, remain in light specifically, I've just been inspired by like the production on that record. Um, I mean, the synth work is so ahead of its time. Brian Eno's mixing is ahead of its time. Everything about the arrangement on those tracks is ahead of its time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that album's influenced I'd me for sure. Totally agree. I love that album so much. And you're right. It was so ahead of its time. Because mm-hmm. when was that? That was like... It was 1980. 1980. Well, in the... That's crazy to think about. What? What's the album, the actual title where he, David Byrne did with Brian Eno? Which one? The, we have it here. I think it's like My Life in the Bush with Ghosts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Have you listened to that? No. Oh my god. It's very. It's you would like it. It's kind of similar to Remain in Light, but they experiment a lot with. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Brian Eno fan. Obviously, like any producer for the most part is going to be. Um, and yeah, I just think I think Remain in Light is probably like their most enduring work, in my opinion. Like I think in fifty hundred years people will still sort of remember that as Mm -hmm. like this record that really like had an impact Mm -hmm. on music as a whole Mm -hmm. i think that that kind of paved the way for a lot of the electronics that were used in the 80s a lot of like the the production techniques like gated reverb and stuff that was kind of one of the first albums to implement those sorts of things so well you're right it is kind of timeless like it doesn't really i mean you can hear it 80s influence in it but yeah but even then it's so like classic sounding it really doesn't fall into the tropes of like Mm -hmm. it's not cliche 80s yeah not at all all. that's what yeah it definitely stands the test of time yeah yeah so who do you think has been like influenced by the talking heads like current or current artists you Mm, think that's a good question um I mean, there's one obvious one that we're going to talk about. That would be Radiohead. <laughs> so we all know where Radiohead got their name, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know? I No, I don't know. You don't? Really? No, no, I don't know. Bailey, do you want to tell them, even though you haven't seen the movie? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, it's from the song Radiohead on True Stories. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen the movie. I didn't know. Yeah, there's think- a song called Radiohead on the True Story soundtrack, and that is where... Um, the group Radiohead derived their name. And I've so, never heard of them. I, I don't know. Really <laughs> <stop it. laughs> and then, so that's actually why um, David Byrne inducted them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's because it was kind of like a, I don't know, yeah. a little history there. Interesting. Even though Tom York wouldn't show up to it. <laughs> Is that shocking? <laughs> Not, Not particularly. We'll, we'll, get a, we'll get around to them again later. <laughs> so, Talking Heads, fabulous. We love that group. We love David Byrne. Anything else? I really wish I could have seen American Utopia on Broadway. But oh, yeah. We were, we were supposed <laughs> we were to, go. to go. We were supposed to go. And then the world shut down. So, you know, hopefully it's back when the world comes back. Yeah. So Radiohead's original name was on a Friday when they signed. Really? Yeah. And I had to look it up because I remember it was like something Friday it was on a Friday, and then they ended up changing it to Radiohead based off of yeah, the song. Yeah, it's not as I don't know if it was like based right? off of the song necessarily, but they would they not just have chose... had the mass success if yeah, they no. had gone I think with they on made a Friday. The, yeah, they I think made that the right would have choice. yes, that would have thrown them like on a Friday. Them. Sounds like a uh, sounds like a early two thousands like <laughs> pop punk group. Yeah, it sounds you know like what? a Paramore ripoff. Or something. <laughs> yeah, something from that realm for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. You ready to move on to, um, we're going to do a little like fun activity. I know Declan loves fun activities. <laughs> oh, man. If you look at his face, he's so excited so about excited. it. 
Um, no, so this is like a controversial, maybe music opinions, and just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Declan. Your favorite Beatles album? Um, Magical Mystery Tour. Sergeant Pepper. The B side of Abbey Road. I actually don't have a full album that I love, but I love really? the B side of Abbey Road. It's great. I don't really care about the A side. But I mean, I do like some other ones. I like the B side of Abbey Road. Yeah, I, yeah it's really I don't good care for the A side. Yeah, it's kind of whatever. But if that was just an album in itself, like an EP, it would've been great. Okay, Rihanna or Beyonce? Can I choose neither? No, <laughs> I don't like either. Just, um, but Rihanna. Okay, Rihanna. Rihanna. Um, Michael Jackson or Prince? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Prince. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wait. No, I meant to say Prince. <laughs> no, Michael Jackson. Michael. No, I meant to say Prince. There's, to me, it's just like there's no comparison just in the significance. Like, Prince released a lot more, but I feel like okay. there's so much to sift through. Like, Michael Jackson is just like hit yeah. after hit after hit after hit. I agree. I tend to like Michael Jackson's music more so than Prince, but... I think Prince, Prince's artistry trumps. I, mean, I don't know, dude. Michael know, Jackson made the so soundtrack for, for this, Sonic but... the Hedgehog 3, so I'm going with Michael Jackson. <laughs> and he sang a song about a rat. That's ben? Have you ever heard that song, Ben? No. Am I showing my age? No, I apparently. I do not know about that. Yeah, it's a thing, but I'm still going with Prince. Yeah, he, he's an That's amazing... That's a hard one. Amazing guitarist. And just, yeah, Prince right. is really. incredible. Like, he's an incredible musician. It's just, to me, like, Michael Jackson is the king of pop, man. Like, okay. I, I can't dispute that. <laughs> um, okay, what's your uh, favorite Metallica album? Ooh, um, probably Injustice for All. Kill Em All. I like the way you looked when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> do like a close up of you <laughs> you see that mine's Master of Puppets I love that album um, Genesis Phil Collins or Peter Gabriel Peter Gabriel I knew you were going to say that yeah. <laughs> definitely Peter Gabriel y'all I'm so cheesy I love Phil Collins I love Phil Collins <laughs> I do all too day. in a different way in a different way I love way. Phil Collins all day Peter Gabriel is cool but you're like way into prog rock like you like prog I mean rock I grew up with it so I wouldn't say I love prog rock. It's just nostalgic for me. Yeah. But I love Peter Gabriel. I like some Peter Gabriel. But I love Peter Genesis, Gabriel. Genesis, yeah, I preferred Phil Collins, but that's obviously a little cheesy of me. Uh, okay, Cure or Depeche Mode? Ooh, that's hard. I know, right? Um, it's, it's about to go. The next one? I don't know how you're going to answer it. It's Depeche Mode. The Cure is kind of whiny, dude. It's a okay. little bit like sullen. Okay. Depeche Mode. You're Depeche Mode? I don't know. It's hard for me. That's a solid tie, honestly. I got you. I don't one. know. If, mm, if I have to pick one, gosh, I don't know. Dave Gahan is so dreamy, but I do love The Cure. I, I think I have to go with The Cure on that one. I told you I saw them in concert and they did five encores. And I finally had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear this. Yes, yeah, so they put it all into their concerts. Okay, you ready? This one's tough. Okay, I'm ready. John Mayer or Michael Bublé? <laughs> uh, oh, God, uh, John Mayer. I mean, yeah, out of those two, I'd go John Mayer. <laughs> John Mayer's a good guitarist. He's just a, such a douche. Um, but my, Michael Bublé has kids, so as a parent, I'm just going <laughs> to root for him because he's trying to take care of his family. Um, and then, leading into our controversial topic of the evening, Radiohead. What is the best Radiohead album out there? Declan. It's not even, like, <laughs> that's a non-question. It's so obvious. It's for the you. Bands. <laughs> Look at bends. Bailey's face. <laughs> it's the Benz. Uh, we'll talk about that. It's the Benz. Bailey, do you want to counter him or give him a chance to... Yeah, you want me to justify myself? Justify his okay. I'd like to hear it. All right. I think the Benz comes in at like kind of the peak 
era of Radiohead for me. Like, I like the era of, like, the Ben's OK Computer. I think everything after that is cool, but just not what I consider to be, like, quintessential Radiohead. So but you're an electronic artist. I know, but it's just, like, it's not that good for electronic music. Like, it really doesn't do it for me. I don't know. It kind of reminds me of when the Smashing Pumpkins made like Ava Adore. Well, I mean, and tried they to make are still a rock stuff. band. Yeah, yeah, but That's... it's I don't know. Like, it doesn't land as much for me. Like, I like Kid A. I like, and I actually like more of Should like we... their later stuff. Are oh, yeah. we transitioning? <laughs> Transition. <laughs> yeah, I I really enjoy Kid A. Um, a Moon Shaped Pool is one of my favorite albums, actually. I, so I think the album is very underrated. Yeah, and I know you and I have talked mm-hmm. about that before. I think it's underrated, too. Um, I think Kid A is kind of overrated, if we're being honest here. I agree. I Actually, Kid A used to be on one of my least favorites. But within the past couple of years, it's like at the top for me. But here's the thing. like With me, each every literally every single Radiohead song has meant something to me at some point in my life. So it's hard... For me to like really pick a favorite because, you know, at some point each one has been my favorite. But I think for me, the one that's kind of stayed true through it all is Hail to a Thief. And it's probably because it was the first album that I ever heard. I kind of got into them a little later. Um, But I don't know. I just I think that really opened my eyes to their writing style and just like the creativity alone yeah what about you Katie (laughs) no I'm with you on that you there's certain things that stick with you so Mm -hmm. for that reason I've always been stuck between the bins and okay computer part of that because I'm a gen xer and that was just very relevant during my time period but okay computer especially just for what I was going through in my life at the time, it just really stuck with me. And Paranoid Android, I think, is one of the best songs ever written. Um, oh, I mean, I think it's safe to say that OK Computer oh, yeah. is, like, one of the top rock albums. Yeah. Period. But then The Benz is, like, beginning to end amazing as well. So it's just, it's hard for me to really pick between those two, but that's definitely where I'm at. But since knowing you guys, I've definitely gotten more into the more recent albums. Mm-hmm. I still can't fully grasp King of Limbs. OK. Can't every- fully get it. I've had so many conversations with customers, and that's the one album that they said they can't get into. And I think it's interesting because, so it was King of Limbs and Rainbows and Hail to a Thief were like my introduction albums. Mm. And I, I don't know. I just, I love King of Limbs. It's not my favorite. It's not one of my favorites, yeah. but I think it's, I think it's a great. Well, and I, I'm not saying discounting that it's good or anything. It's just the one that I personally right. never fully. And I, love, it's one. Of, they're one of my favorite bands of all time. It's just the one album that yeah. I really couldn't truly get into. I think they were. I mean, I can't speak for them, but I feel like they were. It was kind of their experimental project. Mm-hmm. For me, their worst album by far is Pablo Honey. Like I really dislike that album. I love Pablo Honey. Can't do that. Like I. I've tried so many times and like, I don't like that record. Uh, King of Limbs, like didn't really land for me that much, but it was not like something that I really disliked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And yeah, their entire body of work besides that, well, I think I've it, liked, like, you know, you, yeah, you can like it and just not be, you know, in love with it. So I'm not, for sure. love, I'm not in love with Pablo Honey either. Um, but yeah, King of Limbs, I'm not in love with. Uh, yeah, but I like Kid A has grown on me. Moonshape Pool has grown on me a lot since knowing you guys. Moonshape, well, so Moonshape Pool was actually a breakup album for me, so I like instantly connected mm-hmm. to it. And I think we were we talking about True Love Waits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, like they tried to write or put that song. I think he wrote it in the early '90s for his girlfriend, um, longtime girlfriend. I think her name was. Rachel, don't quote me. And I could be wrong. He was married to somebody named Rachel, right? It's probably her. Yes. And she died. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Sad. he wrote the song for her in the early '90s and tried to put it literally on every single album. And then for some reason, it just fit on Moonshape Pool. And that album, I think she died either like it was very close mm-hmm. to either before or after it released. Right. And so to me, it was just kind of like. It's kind of poetic. Ser- yes, yeah, serendipitous almost mm-hmm. to where it was kind of just like that final chapter. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. So that album like hit me hard because you know obviously like you're going through <laughs> a breakup and you know finding that out. Right. But, yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think Moonshade Pool is. It really resonated with me just because it had like the understatedness of OK Computer. But to me, it was more like abstract, more mm-hmm. ambient. And just like, like my problem with OK Computer was always that I didn't feel like there was enough like movement on the record. I felt like it was kind of just this flat, like mm-hmm. kind of solemn vibe the whole time, which isn't a problem, but it just didn't feel very dynamic to me. Whereas a moon shaped pool has that same sort of aesthetic, but I feel like it just mastered it better. It was like, it took the best elements to me of OK Computer, which were the like A, the songwriting, and B, just the moodiness, the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And it takes that atmosphere and it almost boosts it like tenfold, you know? Yeah. But that's why there's something for everybody. You know, we associate right. th- music with things that go on in our life. Mm-hmm. So exactly. Forever, yeah. okay, computer will be certain things going on in my life, whether they were good or bad. Yeah. They were in the past, but <laughs> music is forever. What's like, what's the one album that you go to the most? Like that you just, no matter what mood you're in, you Radio can go Ed? to it. Yeah. The Benz. 100%. Same. See, I think mine's Hail to the Thief. Well, especially uh, like in the store or whatever, I'll just put it on because um, it's, it's, it's got a, some yeah. up, it's got some yeah. down. It's, it's, like a, it's very diverse. Yeah, for me, the Benz, that's why I like it the most. I yeah. feel like it's got this large range, but it still feels very tight and like kind of like focused, you mm-hmm. know? So yeah, yeah I, for me, like for casual listening... Unless I want to be really depressed and like cry myself to sleep, then I'll put on a moon shape pool. But yeah, <laughs> typically I'm not in that mood. So yeah, the bends. Yeah. And then street spirit is such a, a great song to end it yeah. with. So yeah, that's my go-to, but okay. Computer is up there. Yeah. It's always hail to the thief, but lately I've been going to kid a and then amnesiac, mm-hmm. which is basically just a continuation of kid a. Does Anima count as a Radiohead album or EP or whatever? Tom York. It's Tom York. I know. So can we? We can, we can still talk about it. Okay, yes, because okay, I love okay. that album. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I go to that one a lot too. I do too. It is actually. a good album. It's great. I was kind of iffy about it when I first listened to it, like the very first time. And then it was one, the more I listened to it, the more I loved it. And then I saw the video that he released on Netflix and then I lo- then I just like fell in love with it because the visuals and everything just really tied it in together. Yeah, I love that album. Yeah, I love it too. Tom York is he's real special. He's a genius. <laughs> I, he's another one of those. Yes. Kind of like David Byrne. Yeah. So just, is Johnny Greenwood. Oh yeah. Both oh, of them are Yeah. Yeah. I mean like visionary musicians. Of course Radiohead wouldn't be Radiohead without Tom York, but it also would not be Radiohead without Absolutely yeah, not. No, they're both, to me, they're of equal importance. The stuff that he comes up with on the guitar still amazes me. Like, I still don't understand some of the stuff. That and have you writes. ever listened to, like, his film scores that he's yes. done? Like, he did Phantom Thread. Yes. That was beautiful. <laughs> he did uh, You Were Never Really Here, and that mm-hmm. was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So our special guest today is our good friend Declan James is his um, persona, and uh, he is an EDM artist. He has done a lot that I'm going to let him talk about, uh, <laughs> because he, that is like the one genre that, I'll be honest, that I know the least about, and I'm so excited that you're here to um, give me some knowledge on it. Well, he thank also works you. with us. Yeah, yes, he works with here. us. He works here. So. I do, yeah. Um, I'm just the kind of lackey that works for... Uh, the women overlords. Oh, know. that is not true. Just we let him out of his cage. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thanks, guys. It's good to be here. Yeah, I, I'm a DJ and an electronic music producer. Um, I make techno music specifically. Uh, I'm on a label called Drum Code. Uh, for anybody listening that's familiar with techno music. Uh, they're based out of Stockholm. They've been around for about 25 years now, I think. Maybe 30 um, like I think since like 1990, 1991. And I started making music when I was like 15 in my bedroom and it just kind of took off. And ever since then I've been touring periodically and got a good fan base. So yeah. That's funny. I met you, what, five years ago? 
Like four or no, five years ago? No, it would have been like three years ago. Was it three years yeah, ago? Yeah, it wasn't very long ago. Oh, it feels like a long time. It does. I don't know. You were 19. I was 19 and I'm 21. So actually okay, it was two. just two years ago. Okay. Gosh. Okay. I'm old. Time is moving strangely. But I remember you telling me stories about like, you just seem like such a, just like a casual, normal dude. And we just have like regular conversations. And then you would tell me about your gigs and it just seems so surreal that you did that to me. Well, I, it's surreal to me because I, <laughs> I mean, like I live with my parents. <laughs> I'm just kind of like a, a bum, you know, I just kind of like come out. out. You come out at like two o'clock in the morning to do these like Yeah, yeah, I'll come out shows. at two or three or four sometimes yeah. and I'll play for anywhere between like two and ten hours. So oh my gosh. Good Lord. how do you do that? It's just like, well, most people it's like cocaine, but. Not me. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. You, you just do like it. You've it's actually the done same a way. 10 hour set. Yeah, yeah, 10 hour set. It's, you do it in the same way that you would do, like, I mean, that you work. You know, you just treat it as work in some way. So you look at it very, like, pragmatically. At least I do, because that's the only way that I can get through a set mm-hmm. like that. So, I mean, it's just about having, like, uh, when you're really DJing, you're not planning anything out. You're just kind of being spontaneous. It's very, like, I like to compare it and explain it to people in a way that's like, I think it's very similar to jazz music in some ways and that like DJing is very improvisational and it's much, it's like, it's about reading the room that you're in. It's about like feeding off of the energy of the crowd and like trying to recognize like what they're responding to and how you can take them from point A to, which is the start of your set to point B, which is wherever you're going to end it. And it's like, how do I get from point A to point B and make it the most interesting thing I possibly can mm-hmm. that has some sort of arc or story or journey that I'm taking these people on? So um, with a tent, like with a really long extended set, it's just about preparation. It's about having a lot of music and knowing your library. And so for me, it's like when I'm preparing for something like that, I'll spend weeks just downloading music and familiarizing myself with it, queuing it up. Like I'll prepare it so that it's ready for me to go. Do you do like test runs of it? Um, I will sometimes, like I'll kind of play around with it, but like I said, I like to keep it as improvisational and spontaneous as I can. So I don't like to overthink that too much. Mm -hmm. For me, the preparation comes in just knowing what I have and knowing like, I mean, I can typically like match keys, like just, I can hear it. So I can be like, okay, I have this track that I think will be in the same key because I can like tell. Mm -hmm. So like things like that, it's, it's just about familiarizing yourself, knowing your library and knowing like what the core elements of the tracks are and whether they're going to mix well or not. So what's, um, what's a concert look like? What's a crowd, the crowd look like at your shows? Um, it's typically older people than most people would imagine because techno music is sort of like an underground scene. It's more mature than like the average, like, you know, a lot of people imagine like electronic dance music. They think of like rave babies with like pacifiers (laughs) and like, You know, that's definitely a thing in in like mainstream electronic music. But when you get into techno, it's sort of like the the thing that people graduate to because it's more refined and more, it's just harder to like grasp at first. It's one like, that's what I love about it, to be honest with you, is like, for me, it took years to get to the point where I understood techno. For a long time, I thought it was pretentious because it's very, Mm -hmm. it's really repetitive. It's just repetitive loops. But once you like, road to understand and appreciate it it's to me the best thing like the best subgenre of electronic music it's what you're like moving toward the entire time is the sound so um and you know like that that's the base of electronic music electronic music kind of comes out of techno out of people like craft work and like tangerine dream and these and then you know you have detroit techno a little bit later and like that's where all of this other stuff evolved from so it's really like at its core, all electronic music is striving to still maintain what is techno. That's mm-hmm. like the base level of what it is. So do you have like a do you have like a favorite moment or a favorite gig that you did that stands out? Uh yeah. I played this gig actually here in Dallas. It was a hometown show. I played it I wanna say twenty eighteen in August. And it was down at a club called Stereo Live that's down on like Harry Hines. It's like near all the strip clubs and stuff. And it's in this old abandoned movie theater. And um, I was opening for a guy named Black Gummy. I was not direct support. I was like the first guy to come on and there was another guy after me. So I was playing very early. I think I was on at like 10 o'clock, which for nightclub hours is like super early. 
And I was just playing for an hour, 10 to 11. And uh, doors opened at 10. So I was expecting that I would maybe have like 50 people there for my set. And by the time I was halfway done, there were it was packed. It was probably 1,500 people. Oh my gosh. And it was just crazy. Somehow the word had spread and like, it was just one of those nights where like everything kind of came together in mm-hmm. a way that was just perfect. So do you miss that so much right now? Yeah. Cause Absolutely. I miss, <laughs> yeah. I miss live shows so much. Yeah. It's just like, you can't replicate that no, experience. People are trying all. to do that with live streams and it's just not the same thing. It, well, there's no energy being given or received. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. It's like, it's a human interaction. Mm-hmm. It's, it deals with energy and with like aesthetic experience. And you can't have that when there is no exchange right. of, of actual energy. It really makes me interested how the music scene is going to evolve after all this is over. Like what are shows going to look like, you know, whether, I mean, some people are like, it may never go back to normal or what we used to know as normal, which I mean, could be possible. Who knows at this point, but I feel like people are craving that human interaction so much that either it's going to be even more electrifying or... Yeah, I personally think things are going to move back underground after all this and it's going to be like more human interaction. I think it'll it'll be sort of a compensatory response. Because we need it. We need it as artists. We need it as people. Yeah, everybody's craving it. I'm craving live shows. Yeah. Miss them so much. So yeah, I think I think he's right. I think it's going to go more underground, for sure. Yeah, even in my universe, there are people already throwing raves, and there's a whole debate mm. going on about like, is this punk or is this like reckless? You know, and isn't punk? I think those go. Exactly. I think those yeah, go hand had in the, hand. Exactly, exactly. But there is so. sort of a. It's interesting because dance music evolved out of punk music, like. It, it really like guys like Kraftwerk. It's mm-hmm. like the, basically post-punk music. In essence, it, it sort of evolves out of that territory. And the nature of like raves and, and the rave culture is very punk. So it's interesting to see people like freaking out about like they're having illegal raves. It's like, well, that's kind of where this came from. Like that's kind of what this is, and like and what it's always been about is re- rebellion. Mm-hmm. But they say it's different because you're risking, you know, you're you're creating risk for yourself and for others. But once again, it's like. I think part of rebellion is like, why do you smoke a cigarette? You do that because you're acknowledging the risk and acknowledging your mortality and you're still okay with it. That's the act of rebellion is self-destruction. So for me, I think it's the same thing. It's like they're risking getting this virus because they're saying, who cares if I do? Who cares if I get sick and die? Yeah, they just want some life. That's the act of rebellion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Why don't you tell us about some um, musical artists or musicians that heavily influenced your... God, I keep saying heavily. Influenced (laughs) (laughs) influenced your career. Um, Well, I would say, like, first and foremost, I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin IV. That was my favorite album as a kid. My dad played it for me, like, nonstop. That and uh, All That You Can't Leave Behind by U2, which is, like, That's interesting. sort of regarded as a yes. garbage <laughs> album. But I love it, and I still love it to this day because it just holds so many memories, you know? Um, and then, you know, my mom introduced me to electronic music specifically at a very young age. She played uh, Fatboy Slim for me from the time I was, like, two years old. And I loved Fatboy Slim. So um, those were kind of, like, the that's like the genesis of my musical interests, I would say. And then like, you know, in adolescence, I got into Skrillex, which is what most people got into. That's how most people like learned about electronic music that are my age was through Skrillex because he became this weird, like Mm -hmm. dubstep became this weird thing, Mm -hmm. uh, this cultural phenomenon. So I got into Skrillex and then through him, I got into other dubstep artists then I got into like Cascade and slowly migrated to trance music. And then uh, eventually I discovered guys like Enrico San Giuliano, um, Adam Bayer, who runs the record label that I'm on. Uh, I Hate Models, who's like a very influential techno artist right now. And that like they had this very like minimal but abrasive sound. And that's sort of what like pushed me into what I'm making now was like my fascination with this like minimalism and these arrangements that are like 10 minutes long and it's just a loop. But like the fact that they can still keep your interest and that 
they can provoke a response from a crowd by adding one element into a track. It's like with techno music, these guys like Adam Bayer, they add in a hi-hat and people go crazy. Or you take out the kick drum for eight bars and then you add it back in and people go crazy. And so like a lot of my influence has come, I think, from going to clubs specifically and watching how people react to music and how music plays the role in like guiding people's energy levels. I think it's really hard to understand a lot of electronic music until you see it in the context of a club and you experience it for yourself. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, drum code guys, uh, Amelie Lenz. I love Charlotte DeWitt. I love, um, I even like Nina Kravis, which like, I know this probably doesn't mean much to you guys, but like, if anybody's listening to this, that's in the tech, there's going to be somebody out there that's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one guy. The one um, guy. Look at that, I, guy. Yeah. that guy that came in the store the other day and y'all just bonded over whatever. Yeah, we get people about. in sometimes who are into like Aphex Twin and like Burial and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's why and, I'm so glad you're here because Bailey and I are just yeah. like. Oh, you definitely have like yeah. a side yeah, of music Yeah, we're speaking like a different that, language. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. just kind of sat back and watched for a minute. I was There's so been confused. a couple times where someone will come in asking for something and he's just he just takes over and I'm like, thank God absolutely. you're here. Because I, I would not know the answer I guess to that why question. it's important that we have like yeah. diversity on our crew because. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm lacking on so many things that you guys are more well versed in. So I think it's good. You know, yeah. we all have our kind of specialized like specialties. Yeah. Mine just happens to be one that most people don't care about. That's like they sort do, of they're... like the least like I feel like electronic music is like has the largest barrier, mm -hmm. like kind of like the the largest learning curve for people. Like people write it off a lot of the time. It's like, oh, I don't like that like marshmallow type stuff. It's <laughs> that like, marshmallow. Yeah, that's true. It's like they write off the commercial side of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then anything electronic is considered like that's what they associate taboo. with. Not gonna lie, that was me for a very long time. Yeah, and then there's like, the whole, I, like, I mean, there's always the boomer attitude of, like, these newfangled computers, like, making music. Like, all like, you're doing is pressing one button. Yeah, you're, you're pressing a really button, and anything. it's yeah. like, okay, well, like, there's at least most people it. understand what production is now. Yeah. But it's, like, even still, people think electronic music is just, like, cheese ball, like, build-up drop. Well, you know? what's interesting <laughs> is, like, when I got a band, I wanted just, just, like... I don't want to say just instrumentation because electronic is instrumentation, but um, basically like rock instruments. Like I just wanted, you know, your typical, I didn't want anything electronic. And it wasn't until I went into the studio for the first time where they brought out the synths and then my world just like opened up. And it's interesting because now we are kind of moving more towards bringing in a side of electronics that I would have totally shunned like just a couple years ago so it's interesting because that used to be me until you you're lit, you're exposed mm -hmm. to the side of electronics where it's like oh this isn't cheesy this isn't you know yeah and you see that it. evolution happen with a lot of bands like radiohead like, talking exactly and, and i think that's why i connect with radiohead and probably their later albums so much is because of that it's like i can hear a rock band evolve and transform in, into something and bring in electronics and use that creatively to, you know, change their sound and you know, bring out a different emotion. So, yeah. So if you had to like describe your sound to somebody, what would you say? Um, I, you know, I would say like, I take a lot, I, there's still like melodic elements to my stuff. It's not pure minimal techno where it's just like a percussion loop and a kick drum. Like, I still like composition. I like chords and atmosphere. I think for me, the key element to my music is the atmosphere. I care deeply about like spaciness and kind of creating this like alien world within my music. That's what I like is when you listen to a piece, like for me, when I listen to somebody like Tangerine Dream or something, it like you get lost in this atmosphere. And I think that's what's so significant about electronic music is the atmosphere it allows you to create. So for me, like, if I had to describe my music in one word, it would be atmospheric. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Also, I have to leave in, like, five minutes. I have to take my dad to the airport. I guess. 
So thank you, Declan, for being on our inaugural episode of <laughs> Under the Influence. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's an honor, <laughs> truly. Selling Miss America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, that's it for this week. Obviously, if you want to like and subscribe for our YouTube channel, this will be out weekly. Um, and yeah, we'll just bring you more awkwardness and <laughs> music. I'm here. I'm here for it. I'm here for both of it. All right. Thanks, guys.